And one of our great uh, uh, pleasure, our great delight, is to have Deepak coming to speak to us. Deepak is my dear friend and also my teacher. Two things together, that's a wonderful combination. And Deepak is bringing new awareness and new understanding, particularly, perhaps I should mention now, his new book is War of the World Views. And it's a science and spirituality, science versus spirituality, and science and spirituality bringing together. And, and written this book with um, Leonard Mlodinov, <laughs> I can't pronounce his name properly. Deepak will pronounce properly. So this is uh, something that we can look forward to. It will be out in October. And Deepak is going around the world to bring this science and spirituality together. This, this idea that these are two different worlds and they cannot meet, Deepak is challenging, has been challenging for many years, but this book is going to be a, a sort of really groundbreaking book. So without much ado, I would like to invite Deepak to speak to us this afternoon. Deepak. If this is working because our last session, this was not working. Can you hear me up there clearly? OK. And how many people were here for the last session? So <laughs> you were here for the last session? How many people again? <laughs> and how many people just came for this session? OK. Well, the last session was about Tagore and you know, his relevance of Tagore and his um, interactions with Einstein and why Einstein was wrong, even in his science, as far as non-locality was concerned. And Tagore was right, intuitively. And that's, I think, you'll hear more about it as we explore this level that scientists are discovering called non-locality. But Satish asked me to, uh, for this session to focus on healing. And so that's what I'm going to do in the next 45 minutes or so, um, explain why healing is real, uh, why there's a scientific biological basis for it, and why we can actually begin to replicate uh, healing once we understand the mechanism. It doesn't mean that we're never going to get sick or never going to die, because you can die and still be healed, uh, which is, of course, what I was reading about earlier when I was reading the poems on death by Tagore. Um, so here we go. My background is in medicine, in uh, neuroscience and neuroendocrinology. And I went to the United States after I finished from All India Institute of Medical Sciences. I finished my basic medical degree. And there were two things that happened in my life. Well, there were many things that happened in my life. But two things that are very relevant to what we're going to talk about uh, just now. The first is that any physician will tell you, anybody who's in the field of medicine will tell you that uh, biological, uh, biological organisms, particularly human beings, uh, do not respond in predictable manner to treatment. So it's something that we assume, you know, medicine is scientific, medicine is based on reductionist science, medicine, the brain and the body operate according to the laws of classical mechanics or classical physics. We assume that, but it's not true. Okay. You can have two patients who have exactly the same illness. They get the same treatment. They see the same physician. And they can have completely different outcomes. One person can die. The other person can recover. So that's a, that's a common thing. Physicians know about it. They don't talk about it. It's, it's the unexplained phenomenon. It's the X factor. It's the white elephant in the room. We don't want to acknowledge because once we acknowledge, then we have to say what's happening. And then sooner or later, we have to get into consciousness. So, <laughs> so that's the first thing. The second thing is my own field, uh, neuroscience, neuroendocrinology. This is in the earlier days when radioimmunoassay as a technique had just been developed. 
and radioimmunoassays a way in which you can measure molecules in the body. Okay, so in the 70s, uh, this had become very popular because uh, two investigators, uh, one by the name of Rosalind Yalo, had won the Nobel Prize. Now we can measure what's happening in biological systems. And we were measuring what are now well-known chemicals like serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, opiates. Everybody's heard of these, I presume. And what one of my colleagues at that time, uh, named a woman by the name of Candice Pert, who later on, she was a fellow, um, research fellow with, we were all kind of hanging out together. She later went uh, and became the chief of neurochemistry at the National Institutes of Health. And she coined an expression which became relatively popular amongst us, uh, molecules of emotion. So what her basic thesis was that emotional experiences generate molecules and these molecules are neuropeptides because they're found in the brain and peptides because they're protein molecules. And that when you feel different emotions, you have different body chemistry. Now that was very interesting to those of us who were interested in consciousness. And so we started looking everywhere in the body for receptors to these molecules. So, you know, the first place obvious to look, up, look for was immune cells. Immune cells which go by different names, T cells, B cells, macrophages, etc. If you look at the receptor sites uh, of these little cells, uh, they have receptors to the molecules of emotion. So right now, somebody inside you is having a conversation with themselves. And uh, it, this is a very interesting conversation because it has emotional overtones, whether you agree with me, disagree with me, whether I uh, fit into your ideology about what is right, wrong, etc. The conversation never shuts up. It is happening right now. Uh, it's happening even in your sleep, in your dreams. Uh, in a moment, we are going to try and figure out who's this person uh, who never shuts up. But the fact is that the cells of your immune system are responding to this conversation. They're eavesdropping. They're listening to this conversation. What's even more interesting is that the immune cells are not only listening to this conversation, but they are participating in this conversation because they make the same peptides that your brain makes when you're feeling or thinking. If you ask a good neurobiologist today, what's the difference between the immune system and the nervous system? They'll say, there really isn't any. The immune system is a circulating nervous system. It has memory. So when your immune cells look at a, an antigen or a, a invader, a pneumococcus or whatever, they remember, you know, what was my last experience with this fellow? Um, should I leave him alone? Should I go after him? I have no experience with him, but my grandfather did. So, you know, the memory is passed on how to make the precise antibody. Um, not only uh, our immune cells have memory, but they make decisions. So they're conscious cells, okay? They have consciousness. If that's by consciousness, we mean memory and choices, sanskara and vasana or whatever word we want to use. So the immune system is a thinking system. So are you using samskara as consciousness? No, as an expression of consciousness. Consciousness is a field of potential. Okay. So, yeah, your immune cells are thinking. They just don't think in English with an Indian accent. <laughs> okay. Now, this happens everywhere you look in the body. We started to look. It was very exciting, you know. So, we start looking everywhere because you can measure and scientists love to measure. So, we measured. Okay, today if you say, I have a gut feeling about such and such, you're not speaking metaphorically at all. You're speaking literally. Um, your gut makes the same chemicals that your brain makes when you have emotions or thought. In fact, I would say you can trust your gut feelings a little more because your gut cells haven't yet learned how to doubt their own thinking. Today, we know that 80% of our heart cells, for example, are what some cardiologists or cardiac uh, physiologists call neurocardiocytes. Neuro, 
They're like brain cells, neurons, and they're cardiocytes, they pump blood, but they make the molecules of emotion. Now, I'll cut this story very short because it's a 35-year-old story in development, but your mind is not in your brain, okay? It's everywhere. It's in all the cells of your body, and all the cells of your body are, are relating to all the cells in two ways. One is local communication through energy and information, local communication. So when I communicate with you on your cell phone, for example, that's a local communication. Or I call you on the phone or uh, through the internet, that's local. It involves energy and information. And there's another kind of communication that occurs, it's called non-local, which uh, I spoke about a little bit earlier, which is almost instantaneous. It's not communication, but it's correlation. Every cell correlates with every other cell instantly. Your body has 100 trillion cells, which is more than all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Every cell is doing 100,000 activities per second, and every cell tracks and synchronizes with every other cell instantly, without sending messages, no signals, okay? It's what is called non-local correlation, and this is a new field, it's called quantum biology. Uh, that biological organisms don't function uh, linearly, they function in an integrated manner. My body is an integrated whole. My brain is an integrated whole, and it's participating with what we call the environment, which is a terrible word. The, uh, it's the biosphere of which we are an activity. You know, we use these words, body, environment, and we think that's different, but it's actually one system. Okay, it's an integrated system. Those trees are your lungs. The earth is recycling as your body. The rivers and waters are recycling as your circulation. This air is your breath. So why do we call the environment? Okay. We have a personal body, we have an extended body, and they're both equally ours because you can't live with one or the other. Okay, they're equally crucial to our sense of I exist. So everything functions as an integrated uh, system and this integration is felt to be non-local. There's physics to explain this, okay? But this is how you can explain certain things which were unexplainable before. How does a human body, for example, do so many things simultaneously? You can think thoughts, play a piano, kill germs, remove toxins, make a baby all at the same time. And at the same time, your biological rhythms are the symphony of the whole universe. So that's non-local. How does a single cell become the 100 trillion cells only in 50 replications? Only 50 replications to make a whole body. Now, if I had videos I was telling Satish, yeah, we make films on this, and it's very impressive to see what's really happening and the sense of wonder that's evoked when you see what's happening in your body. Okay, so that's non-local correlation. These are the two kinds of things. And the whole thing is being orchestrated through the flow of energy and information, but also non-locally. Beyond the non-locally means outside of space-time. Okay. So that's the first thing to understand. The second thing to understand is that your body is not a structure. First of all, the mind is everywhere, but the second is your body is not a structure. You know, when we think of this, we say this is a structure. Right? But even this is not a structure, it's a process. If you go to the level of subatomic particles, this is a very dynamic process right now. But your body is definitely not a structure. It's not a noun, it's a verb. And there's nothing in the universe that's a noun. Nouns are conventions of language. They are not expressions of truth because there is nothing in the universe that stands still, even for a second, okay? So your body is dynamic, it's in exchange with all the elements and forces of the universe, and this happens through eating, breathing, digestion, metabolism, elimination, how we experience the world through our five senses, sound, touch, sight, taste, smell, that's where Ayurveda comes in, because we use these modalities to change biological expression. But then there's a whole realm of experience which is subjective, which is trans-empirical, which means it's not experienced through the senses. Empiricism means experienced through the senses and measurable. But there's a whole realm of experience that is subjective, 
Okay, our thoughts, our feelings, our desires, our imagination, insight, intuition, creativity, all of that, the, the deepest level of subjectivity for which science, by the way, has no explanation how, how the brain produces subjective experience. Uh, we call that the hard problem in science. But you know, we having, you close your eyes and you suddenly become aware of all this thing that's happening in your subjectivity and that influences everything that's happening in the body. Today, <coughs> it's possible to do a, a little bit of mathematical calculations based on what are called radioactive isotope studies. And you can prove without a shadow of doubt that right this moment, you have a million atoms that were once in the body of Jesus Christ, or Buddha, or anyone you want to think about. In just the last three weeks, a quadrillion atoms have gone through your body that have gone through the body of every other living species on this planet. So think of a tree in Africa, a squirrel in Siberia, a taxi driver in Calcutta. You have stuff in your body that was there only three weeks ago. Okay. In less than one year, you recycle now. We used to think it was five, seven years. In less than one year, you recycle 98% of all the matter in your body. So at the atomic molecular level, you have a new liver every six weeks a new stomach lining every five days, new skin once a month, a new skeleton. It seems so hard, but a skeleton is a dynamic organ with calcium, phosphorus, everything coming and going. And by the end of one year, you replace almost all your body, 98%, a few bits of collagen and cartilage which take a little longer turnover. So this body that Satish invited um, is my 2011 model. And <laughs> The last time I came, I brought with me the same suitcase, but not the same physical body. Okay. I brought, my, my suitcase is a little longer shelf life than my physical body. So, you know, this raises a big question in science today. Who are you? If you think you're your physical body, then you have a bit of a problem. Which one are you talking about? So my, while my physical body has recycled from the ecosystem, it's part of the biosphere, the unfortunate word environment, um, while it's recycled and you know, my personal body from year 2010 is dead, it's gone. I haven't died in the meanwhile, so I hope you agree this is scientific proof for the existence of life after death <laughs> because our consciousness is constantly outliving the death of the molecules through which it expresses itself. It's doing it right now. You don't need further proof of reincarnation. These are reincarnated cells, okay? These weren't there a month ago, but they remember the difference between heart and cold and pleasure and pain. It's the memory that's reincarnating, okay? It's the memory. It's always reincarnating as this physical body. So let's go a little deeper. You go look at these molecules that are recycling. You see their atoms, and then you look at the atoms, and they're subatomic particles, and they're all coming from an emptiness, and that's where the real action is, that emptiness. Now, today scientists call it the quantum vacuum of the universe, which isn't disappeared, it's right there. If that wasn't active, you and I wouldn't be here. Okay, the quantum vacuum didn't disappear with the Big Bang. It just started a whole series of um, activities that are still going on, but the quantum vacuum of physics is, the, is there right this moment, and you and I and everything exists because it's there. That's what scientists call it, but you know, you look at the poetry of Rumi 700 years ago, he says, we come spinning out of nothingness scattering stars like dust. He says, look at these worlds spinning out of nothingness. This is within your power. Um, who else? The Buddhists talk about shunyata, that is beyond subject-object split, beyond the observer and the observed. Vedantists, they talk about chitakash. The akash is not empty, but it's full of of, well, chit means consciousness, so they go even beyond, but any scientist will tell you today that one cubic centimeter of space, right here, one cubic centimeter of space has 10 to the power of 37 times more mass energy than the entire universe. 
incomprehensible. That includes the Milky Way galaxy, Andromeda, everything, all the suns, the stars, the planet. There's more mass energy here. Of course, we don't know how that becomes this. At least science doesn't know. Vedantists have a great idea about that. But science has yet not figured out how the micro or quantum world becomes the macro or classical physical world. They don't know. Pretty good close to it, but not there. You know, the, if you've kept up with the literature, unified field and quantum gravity, so on, we don't know. As I said earlier, Sir Arthur Eddington said very elegantly, something unknown is doing we don't know what. <laughs> and that's the best explanation we have of everything in reality. Okay. There's no mechanical explanation that will show you uh, why you feel the way you feel, and why, how you remember or how you imagine. As I said earlier, it's called the hard problem in science. Because it's called hard because we don't even have a theory for it. So let's go back to it. So this body is recycling, but it's also energy and information. And it's constantly in dynamic exchange with the ecosystem. If the ecosystem is diseased, we are diseased. If we are diseased, the ecosystem is diseased. And this applies not only physically to us, but at every level, emotional, mental, and so on, because what we call mind and matter are inseparable. You know, as I said earlier also, there are three ways that scientists or philosophers look at the world. One is dualism, which is out because it violates the laws of conservation of energy. So there's no such dualistic. Descartes was wrong. Okay. Then the second view, which is material monism, that matter is everything. But the problem with that is when you look at matter, it becomes non-material, ultimately. And then there's the third view, which is uh, monistic idealism, that there's only consciousness, and it experiences itself as the mind and the body and the physical world. So what is the mind? What is the mind? And where is the mind? And this is. Very interesting if you start to think about it. The best definition I can give you of what mind is, is as follows. And this is, comes after a lot of thought, after asking a lot of people, consulting with a lot of people. The following definition you will find nobody will object to it because it is actually correct. <laughs> okay. The, the mind. The mind is an embodied and relational process. The mind is an embodied and relational process that regulates the flow of energy and information. I'll repeat that. The mind is an embodied and relational process that regulates the flow of energy and information. Okay, so, so what is energy? Energy is that which has the capacity to move things, is work. That's how we define it in physics. And what is information? Information is data and facts, but actually physics has a better, information theory has a better definition of it. Information is the resolution of uncertainty. Okay, so when the quantum field, which is uncertain, becomes factual, that's what we call information. The mind, once again, is an embodied and relational process that regulates the flow of energy and information. So where's my mind? Well, it's entangled with yours. Because as soon as I say something, and right now, I'm the one who's speaking, but we could be having a dialogue, but you're responding, right? So as I'm speaking and you're responding and I'm getting some feedback, our minds are dancing. And as a result of that mental representation in each of our consciousnesses, all our consciousness right now, our brains are also entangled because there's no mental event that does not have a neural correlate. I'll repeat, there's no mental event that does not have a neural correlate, which doesn't mean we understand consciousness. It just means that if I ask, if you have a mental event, so let's say I ask you to ask a simple question of yourself, who am I? What do I want? What's my purpose? If you reflect, that activates your prefrontal cortex. 
if you have an emotional experience, like I love my, I love my grandchild, or I love um, um, my husband or wife, or I feel compassion for so and so, that has another correlate, it's in your limbic brain. If you have fear, it has another correlate, it's in your amygdala. There is no mental event that does not have a neural correlate. And there is no neural correlate that doesn't have a biological correlate. Why? Because the brain functions as an integrated whole, there's an autonomic system, there's a sympathetic nervous system, the neuropeptides I mentioned, the chemicals, neurotransmitters, they're related to these activities. So everything in your body that's happening is integrated. Your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, your social interactions, your environment so-called, your extended body, your ecosystem, it's all one process. You know, the problem with Cartesian dualistic thinking is we created divisions that didn't exist. So mind and body, body and environment, and now we're spending hundreds of years to see what the connection is. When there was no division in the first place, it's a single process. Your breathing, your heart rate, your autonomic system, your, which includes your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, different parts of your brain, and your biology, your immune system, it's all a single process. And furthermore, it's entangled with other minds and other bodies. Because if I say something, I say to you, Satish, you know, the board of trustees just decided that they are broke and this place is closed, that would raise your blood pressure a little bit, okay? <laughs> and your heart would speed up and your platelets would get sticky. And all I've said is a sentence, right? Okay, so the sentence was in English, but it had been in Swahili, it wouldn't have made a difference. Okay, so your consciousness processes meaning. And by the way, there's no computer that can process meaning. Okay, that's the whole reason why the brain is not the source of your consciousness. No physical system can either process meaning or imagine or remember or be inspired or have all the things that make us human or biological organisms. So it's a single process and it's entangled. Entangled means that my thoughts and my feelings and my emotions influence yours and that we can see what the mechanism is, by the way. It's a neural mechanism, it's called limbic resonance. So I influence, my mind is right now being monitored by, regulated by, and regulating by your mind. It's inseparable, it's totally entangled. There is no such thing as a separate mind. You know, Buddha was right. He said all human suffering comes from the socially induced hallucination of the separate mind which doesn't exist. It doesn't exist, okay? There's no person inside you that I could call, this is you, okay? There's no person there. Your, everything that you call yourself depends on the other, okay? That includes everything you can possibly think of, including your biology. Our minds are entangled, our bodies are entangled because the mind is not separate from the body. Okay, so all, every physiological process that is occurring in my body is dependent on you. Every emotional, my emotional well-being is dependent on you. You know, in the Yoga Vaishishta, the great sage Vaishishta, he says, dear ones, we have all created each other in our fancy. Okay? <laughs> And that happens to be a biological truth. And this now we say, how far does this extend? How do, far does it extend? Okay. Does it extend just to human species or all living species? And when you say all living species, where do we stop? Okay. We know that dogs can respond to you. They share your emotions. We know that other life forms are entangled with us. And what we're beginning to realize is even the ecosystem, because the ecosystem is not a dead system, it's an alive biological biosphere. The biosphere and you are entangled. And this entanglement is instantaneous. Which leads to an amazing thing. You say, okay, entanglement is all across the ecosystem, all across the biosphere, 
But now, science, because of non-locality, says the entanglement extends outside the planet. It's all over the universe. We are part of a living cosmos. Teilhard de Chardin, the Christian theologian, he had nice words, huh? the geosphere, the biosphere, the astrosphere, the theosphere, they're all entangled. And so this entanglement is horizontal, which means you and I are entangled in space, but it's also vertical. Why? Because my mind is influenced by the mind of my parents, who are no longer with me, but I have memories of okay, my childhood. And their parents, and then our culture, and then our history. It gets pretty complicated. Your mind exists because of all minds that have ever existed and will exist in the future. The entanglement is horizontal, it's vertical. And now because we have Twitter and Facebook and the internet, the entanglement is increasing, right? Because <laughs> I just went outside and there's an elephant over there or a simulated elephant, I took a picture and I sent it on Twitter with my Blackberry. I said, elephant break, okay? <laughs> and half a million people are retweeting that right now, knowing that there's a conference in Tagore, right here at Dartington. So we're entangled. And that leads to very interesting, first of all, conceptually, but now look at it from a point of view of well-being. So one of my other, other jobs, if you will, is that I'm also a, a senior scientist at Gallup organization. So I'm sure you've heard of Gallup. You know, they do polls, surveys. And so a few years ago, we said, let's start doing, uh, collecting data on well-being, okay? So we started with very simple things. We started, we first divided well-being into five categories. Career well-being, social well-being, physical and emotional well-being, um, financial well-being, and community well-being. These are the five categories we started with. So, and it's very simple. We take surveys. There are 2,000 people designing these studies, and Gallup has perfected the art of taking questions and, you know, they're the best people as far as designing studies to ask questions. So first thing was career well-being. And we asked a very simple question. Do you love what you do every day? Do you love your job? Only 20% of the people in the world said yes. 80% dislike what they do every day. In the world, and there are differences. You know, there are differences between, say, Chad and Denmark and Sweden, but average, 20%. Only 20% people love their jobs. The other statistic was that more people die in our civilization on Monday morning at 9 o'clock than any other time. <laughs> no other animal knows the difference between Monday and Tuesday. This is an extraordinary accomplishment for which only the human species can take credit. <laughs> We die on Monday mornings of heart attacks at 9 o'clock. And the biggest sickness is time sickness. Everybody is running out of time. Okay? And they have speeded up biological clocks. They have faster heart rates, jittery platelets, higher blood pressure, dropping dead of heart attacks. Time has run out. Okay? Because they're saying to themselves, I have no time. Okay. Tagore had a relationship with eternity. I have time. I've, would love to read one or two of his poems on the timeless experience. So that's one statistic. The other statistic was these are very practical things. If you are working in an, in an environment where your um, where your supervisor or manager or whatever ignores you, your rate of disengagement goes up by forty five percent, and within three or four months you start to get sick because nothing that happens in the mind doesn't have a biological correlate. 45%, it goes up. If your manager or, or supervisor doesn't ignore you, um, but criticizes you, you get better. Your rate of disengagement goes down to 20% because you would rather be criticized than ignored. See, when you're ignored, you don't exist. When you're criticized, at least now I'm acknowledging that you exist, so you get better, 20% down. If, on the other hand, your supervisor or manager 
not only notices you, but acknowledges a single strength that you have. Your rate of disengagement goes down by less than 1%, and your physical health improves. This is data that is proved now. We've done it many times. So obviously, you know, why don't we correct this situation? In the US alone, they, we estimate in Gallup that disengaged and actively disengaged workers, actively disengaged are people who are unhappy, but they come to work with the express intention of making other people unhappy. Okay. <laughs> Between the active and disengaged and disengaged, the annual cost in the US alone, I don't know the figures from elsewhere, is $380 billion. Okay, and it all means, you know, Gallup says you find the right environment to work in and use your strengths and be in your dharma, as we would say. Okay, and you're all set. Can we not create those environments? And that's another part of our Gallup work that we evaluate people's strengths. So you can, I can sit down with you for two hours and you can do it on the computer. If you want, you can go to Strength Finders on Gallup and you will find out the five things that you're really passionate about, then spend your life doing that and create an environment where everybody notices the great strengths of each other and actually helps each other and everything improves. Health improves, productivity improves, well-being in general improves. And there's a lot more to say about this, but let me move to the second thing, which is social well-being. Social well-being. If you have a happy friend, your happiness will go up by 15%. But if your happy friend has a happy friend that you don't know, it goes up another 10%. <laughs> and if your happy friend has a happy friend who has a happy friend that you don't know, it keeps going up. So, and you know, it keeps going on. Third degree of separation, fourth degree, fifth degree, sixth degree. So the first question we asked ourselves when we saw this, how does the happiness of people that you don't know affect your happiness? Like you don't know these people. Okay. So you see somebody in Brighton, they're walking on the street, their happiness affects your happiness. And if it affects your happiness, it affects your well-being because your mind is entangled with your body. Right? So how does that happen? And there are many ways to explain that. One, the best explanation which is both Vedantic and comes from physics. Schrodinger said, consciousness is singular that has no plural. Okay. That's the best explanation because at the deepest level, consciousness is unified. There is no separation, what we call pure consciousness, samadhi or whatever. So just like electricity is powering my Blackberry, and this microphone, and my computer, and my radio, and my television set, so too consciousness is downloading in everyone from the same source. Okay? So it's a singular that has no plural. And something is affected. And I was saying non-locality. If you tickle the universe here, it laughs there. If you have a, ask a question here, it answers there. Because consciousness non-locally is correlated everywhere. That's the deeper question. There's mathematics to prove that. But on a very simplistic level, if you and I are having a conversation, then of course my mind is affected by all the things that are happening in my life. You know, if I'm concerned about my children, about my job. So actually when you and I have a conversation, it's not just you and me. It's all the people in my life and all the people in your life. We're entangled. And then they have people in their life. So Okay, so we go deeper. We see entanglement exists everywhere. So the happiness of your perceived enemies is good for your well-being. Okay? There's no getting out of it. Okay? It's good for your well-being. We go to the other areas, and we have only five minutes left, so I just want to tell you this. This is what happens, okay? If you go from social well-being to physical well-being, which requires very good, few things like good sleep, uh, exercise, adequate breathing, and food that doesn't come in a can or has a label, you're all set. Okay. 
That's physical well-being. And then there's financial well-being. Don't spend money that you haven't earned to buy things that you haven't, uh, that you don't need to impress people that you don't like. <laughs> it, it's, the, it's the cause of the economic crisis. Okay. And then there's community well-being. What in India we say, seva, satsang, sam, simran. So you combine all this, this is well-being, okay? And it's totally in your control. Then there's spiritual well-being, which addresses bigger questions. Who am I? What's the meaning of death? Does God exist? Et cetera, et cetera. Here are the five breakthroughs. If you understand the five breakthroughs in science, you'll understand how to heal. The first is, the first breakthrough, conceptual. Your body is not a structure, it's a process. It's a process in consciousness. Second breakthrough, your genes are not deterministic. See, that's another big, huge. When President Clinton, in the year 2001, they said, we've deciphered the human genome. We found the alphabet in which God created life. Not true. You have only 23,000 genes, and most of them you share with everybody else. Like 65% of your genes are the same as a banana. 80% of your genes are the same as a mouse. 98%. There's unity of life. And that includes our genes, and our genes are not deterministic. You turn them on and off by the way you feel, the way you think, the way you relate, your relationships, your environment, your food, your sleep, your exercise. And I just met with Elizabeth Blackburn, who won the Nobel Prize in 2001, uh, 2009, sorry, for telomerase, an enzyme that influences your lifespan, your biological clock. People who meditate, uh, vipassana and other, you know, mantra meditation, their telomerase goes up by 30% within four months. So your genes are responding to your mental activity. Okay, so that's the second breakthrough. Your genes are not deterministic. Third breakthrough, your brain is not a structure. The whole field of neuroplasticity, you can change your brain structure. So if you do... You know, if you do the Buddhist Vipassana meditation or you cultivate attitudes like um, uh, compassion, like loving kindness, what the Buddhists call the four divine qualities, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, your whole brain starts to change. Your limbic brain changes, your cortical brain changes. When you reflect, it changes. When you override your automatic responses, it changes. Bottom line, you don't have a fixed brain. That's the third breakthrough. Fourth breakthrough is you can change your body because you can change your brain and you can change your genes. That now there's all this research which is coming out on the biomarkers of aging. You know, there are 15 of them. All of them are reversible by at least 10, 15 years. So, you know, we're going to see a new expression. None of this is technology. It's all internal work, right? So your brain is not fixed. Your genes are not fixed. Your body is not fixed. It's all a process. Next breakthrough, you can change your relationship to time, okay? <laughs> Find the timeless within you. And that is actually the real breakthrough because time is, is how we measure our experiences. When you're having a good time, what do you say? Time flew, right? Or when you're bored, what do you say? Time dragged. When you have 10 deadlines, then of course you say, I'm running out of time. So these are the major breakthroughs, but they lead us to a deeper realm of our own soul, which is non-local. When we are connected with that part of ourselves, then, of course, we experience the time. Let's try this. Are you listening to me right now? And I'm going to finish, Satish. As you're listening to me, just turn your attention. As you're listening to me right now, just turn your attention to who's listening. So as you're listening to me, be aware of the listener. That's your soul. It's not your mind, which might be saying, uh, I wish I'd gone to the bathroom before the lecture. <laughs> Whatever. That's a conversation. But that part of you is timeless, OK? And we metabolize the experience of time into what we call our biological clock. So I'll end with, um, and there's more to say, but 
next time. You know, the soul is the place of love, of compassion, of joy, of equanimity, of grace, of synchronicity, of everything that makes us um, alive and human. Time is endless in your hands, my Lord. There is none to count your minutes. Days and nights pass, and ages bloom and fade like flowers. You know how to wait. Your centuries follow each other, perfecting a small wild flower. But we, we have no time to lose. And having no time, we must scramble for our chances. We are too poor to be late. And so it is that time goes by, while I give it to every querulous man who claims it, and your altar, my Lord, is empty of all offerings to the last. At the end of the day, I hasten in fear that your gate will be shut, but I find that there is yet time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I said uh, this morning, <clears throat> my mother used to say, when God made time, he made plenty of it. But my wonderful producer, Victoria, says, no time, we have next. <laughs> so we have to compromise between my mother and my producer. But Deepak, in this eternal hour, you have done wonder. And every word you have spoken has reached to deepest corner of my soul and mind. So thank you for that wonderful one hour of presentation. And that one hour really flew, <laughs> like minutes or seconds, it really flew. So thank you very much, such engaging and enlightening presentation. Thank you. I would have few minutes of questions, and I would like, in the previous session, someone who did not ask questions to start with that person. So anybody who did not ask, a lady there in that corner, in purple, purple jacket. Should we disentangle ourselves from miserable people? Say that again. Say, say again. Should we disentangle ourselves from miserable people? From disentangle ourselves? A absolutely not, because the more you experience the suffering of another person, the more you have the desire, even the mental desire to alleviate it, you get better. Your health improves. The suffering of other people is what gives birth. Compassion is what gets, gives birth to love. And love is what ultimately causes healing. So without compassion, there is no love. And Thank love you. has to also be Thank in action. Love uh, without action is, is meaningless, yeah. and action without love is irrelevant. So it's all connected. Emily. No. Yeah, I can hear. Um, take uh, reflective, deep, expansive, you know, the rest of this question. Do you, think, yes. do you think social transformation is possible in the absence of personal transformation? No, definitely not. So right there, you know, uh, since we're talking about Mahatma Gandhi, he said, can you be the change you want to see in the world? Because otherwise we just become angry peace activists or angry <laughs> environmental <laughs> activists. You know, and that adds, if consciousness is a field, every bit of anger of self-righteous outrage adds to the anger of the world. So, outrage by the word. Word means rage, right? So, find your own sobriety, find your own peace, and then peace can be created by those who are peaceful. Love can be created by those who have loved. So, there is urgency, but the urgency is take care of yourself first.
on the back there. And then you, Wendy. Thank you. We have an uh, aging population. Can you tell us a little bit about dementia? Can you keep a bit closer? We have aging population. Can you tell us a little bit about dementia and what we can do to... Dementia. Dementia. Okay. Yes. Um, you know, I actually am working with uh, a friend of mine, Rudy Tanzi, who runs the dementia unit at Harvard Medical School. And what he's saying, and he's discovered three of the genes, four genes that are presumably responsible for Alzheimer's. But actually what he's saying is that everything from sensory stimulation to personal relationships to being with other people will actually thwart this, will change the behavior of the genes, the same thing I was saying earlier. The fact is that we are going to see more and more people getting into um, you know, the 80s and 90s, they say, you know, today, today's 80s, yesterday's 60, and today's 60s, yesterday's uh, 40, because um, as we begin to understand the mechanics of aging and influence it through the way we live, uh, we can combine the wisdom of experience with uh, a different kind of biology. And all the demographic research shows that in those cultures where the aging are respected, where they are venerated, where they are made to feel useful, where they become the visionaries for society, aging has a completely different biological response. Thank you. Wendy. It's okay, it's okay, just you use, can you hear me? speak. Um, with this question of entanglement, uh, Deepak, can you explain to me why my bank account doesn't get entangled with others who have sort of <laughs> rather more? Why the reason your bank account doesn't get entangled with others is that a lot of people do not understand that being extremely rich is also poverty consciousness. You know, there are two kinds of people who think about money, the extremely poor and the extremely rich. And I can show you all the studies that show that your bank account will never make you happy. You know, in fact, if you win the lottery, you'll be very ecstatic for a few weeks. Then you'll start to plateau. Within one year, you'll actually be more miserable than you were before you won the lottery. This is, there's data to show that. Because now all you do is think about money, you know. So don't even think that the bank account is crucial to your well-being. Thank you. Last question here. I'm afraid. This will be the last question. Hi there, Deepak. I'm making a documentary about people's ability to heal themselves from incurable terminal illnesses because I've seen this and I want to empower people to that possibility. And somewhere there's a balance between that, getting that across and also um, remembering that we're mortal. We're going to be leaving this planet at some point. Maybe we've got karma. And I'd just like to know your thoughts about that. First of all, healing is real. So what does happen when people heal? What's really happening? They are returning to homeostasis. You know what homeostasis is, right? Self-regulation, our baseline state, all the things that keep us in balance, blood sugar, body temperature regulation, hormone levels. So anytime somebody has a healing, they're returning to homeostasis. And if you look at the word healing or the word health, or the word holy, it's the same word. Healing is the return of the memory of wholeness. Now, in my experience, even with patients who heal, you know, these remissions that you talk about, and there are plenty of them, by the way, you know, and you shouldn't discount a remission because it's rare. If it happens, it has a mechanism. And as scientists, it behooves us to find out what the mechanism is, no matter how rare it is. And in the few cases that I have really focused on, where somebody had a terminal illness and they recovered, and there's a registry for this. If you go to noetic.org, you'll find noeticsciences.org, you'll find all the registry for thousands of remissions from terminal cancer, brain tumors, etc. There's some very mysterious shift in consciousness where the person's identity becomes transpersonal. And the most significant thing that happens to them is they lose the fear of death, like Tagore. Okay. And when you lose the fear of death, then 
there's nothing else to fear because the ultimate fear, isn't it? It's the fear of the unknown. It's the fear of um, leaving aside that which you're attached to. And there's a whole different biology that goes with that. Cortisol levels, adrenaline, platelets, stickiness, immune response, all is related to this absolutely state of profound equanimity. You know, so that's the response. It's, it's equanimity. It's what Buddha called, um, I forget the Sanskrit word. Sukh dukhe same kritva labha labhe jaya jayo Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, but That's equanimity. Uh, and Buddha's four qualities? Aapko uh, aati hongi. Yeah. Char. Loving kindness. Joy. Joy. Mudita. Uh, compassion. And equanimity. That's equanimity. the mechanism of healing. It has its own biology. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, Deepak, my commercial, Deepak's article about Tagore and death and healing <laughs> in the Tagore special issue. <laughs> Please buy a copy, and if you are not a subscriber, subscribe. If you are a subscriber, give a gift subscription. If you are rich, become a life subscriber. You are super rich and bank account is too heavy. Become a patron, give donation, support researchers so we can have such events again and again. Thank you. Thank you.